Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for joining me, uh, especially in these high numbers. I'm honored that you take the time uh, to watch this presentation on uh, Java agents, which is uh, something I work with a, lit, uh, a lot. Uh, I'm otherwise a software consultant in Oslo, Norway. I'm originally German, um, but I've lived there for a while. And uh, I write a library called ByteBuddy as well, which uh, I want to talk about today. But not only, I want to explain to you the complex of Java agents, which is something you might have heard of, but the goal of this talk is to basically present uh, what Java agents are, what they can be used for, and then I want to show you at least, or at least give you a teaser to explain to you how you can implement Java agents yourself, and a few examples of where you probably already are using Java agents. So the agenda, and uh, there's a chance we won't make all of these points uh, in, a, in a thorough manner, but we'll hopefully get a good overview of everything. We I want to show you a set the fundamentals, show you what code instrumentation is, what bytecode instrumentation is, uh, talk a bit about class loading, because you have to understand class loading to understand uh, Java agents, unfortunately, but it's a good thing to understand anyways. The class loading is a pretty uh, complex topic of their own, and then if you have time, we, we, show into, we look into a few general concepts around it as well. So, what are Java agents? The, the most basic first question to ask. And uh, you all know Java programming uh, at least that much, I assume, that you know what a main method is. That's the first thing you learn typically with Java. You learn how to remember typing the words public, static, void, main as your entry point to a Java program. And you probably also know that you can uh, root such a main method in a manifest file to basically make your Java binary executable from the command line. You can type Java and some jar file, and it will load um, the main class and, and start the program that you have written. A, a Java agent, in principle, is not much else than that, only that the ma main method is not called main, but pre-main. And as the name suggests, a pre-main method is executed before the main method. And very similar to the main class entry in a manifest, you just add a pre-main class uh, uh, entry in a, in a manifest again, which then triggers that. And the interesting part about it is that you can chain that. So you can have several agents, and as many as you want to, and they will just execute in the order they are put on the command line um, before your main application. And of course, you can ask the question, what does this, why does this meaningful? Why can't you just add code in the beginning of your main method? But the big strength of it is that you can have different jar files that you uh, put in the same JVM process, and then you have combined uh, two programs that are completely separate uh, without merging them in, a, in, a, in any stage of your compilation, so you can have completely separate development processes for two artifacts, and then only link them together in the same JVM process once you execute a program. And that's not altered. Uh, that's two entry points now that we have learned the JVM has, the main entry point and the pre-main entry point. There's also a possibility to run an agent in parallel to the actual program. There's a dedicated thread on the JVM, the attachment thread, where you can call uh, agents that are then, so I, I like to call them dynamic agents, that's not official terminology, but that you run in parallel to your program on a dedicated thread. Uh, then all that changes is that the, the entry main method is called agent main and not pre main anymore, and that the manifest entry file is called agent class and not pre main class. So basically, that's all uh, you have to do, and then you have written your own agent, right? So. And again, you can run them in parallel, but there's only one attachment thread. So even if you have different tools that attach in parallel to a process, they have to be final. If they occupy the attachment thread forever, then you will never be able to attach another agent because the agent main method never exits, right? So how do you run a static agent in Java? There's not much to it. You can try this at home. It's not that much code as you find on the slide. You type public static void pre-main instead of main, and instead of giving it a string of array as an argument, you just have a single string. So there's only one argument you can provide to an agent, and it's optional. You can omit it, and this value will be null. And the most trivial agent will just print out hello world, uh, as, as one does if you want to learn new technology. And the way you attach your agent is you run whatever Java program you want, and you put this minus Java agent command line parameter on, right? And what you will observe is that your application starts up, and prints this, and then resumes as you would expect it. And you can do this with any Java application. You can do this with the WebSphere application server, since it's all just a Java process, right? You don't give ownership to the actual program before you have executed your pre-main. And you might ask, what can this be used for? And then don't worry, I'll show you a much more um, 
exciting application, but even this already can be useful. Let's say you want to do some dynamic setup of your Java virtual machine, right? You want to install a security manager, for example, or you want to set some system properties. And you could do all that on a command line, right? But maybe for operations it's easier if you give them a jar file and say, like, this jar file configures our JVM, and, for example, you you have a jar that you downloaded somewhere and you don't trust it, but you still want to run it. So you want to sandbox it properly by using a security manager, by maybe forbidding file access because it's not supposed to do that. And you can encapsulate all this logic in a small Java program, make it a Java agent, and distribute it to security applications. So th this, this is something people do, and this is something you can do if you ha ever have the use case for it, right? Uh, dynamic Java agent, and again, warning, that's just my terminology, so if you Google uh, static Java agent and dynamic Java agents, you always end up on my blog postings because <laughs> it's my terminology, uh, but I kind of find it an intuitive way to uh, uh, distinguish the two. A dynamic Java agent is something that you don't add to the command line at all, right? So if you just run any Java process it, and it keeps on running, uh, you can still attach an agent to it, uh, which you right as here, right, with the Asian main method that I mentioned. And then the JVM has a special API, which is so-called attachment API. Uh, and it's located in its own module now since Java 9, uh, the JDK attach module. Before that, it was uh, in its own jar file, the tools.jar file, which you found in your JDK distribution. And it has an API, the virtual machine API, where you can just give it a process ID, a PID, and you say attach to this PID. And then actually what happens is that your process B gets a hook into your Java process A and is allowed to push jar files into it, like this agent jar file that you want to deploy. Then you load it, and then in this foreign JVM process that has never known your jar file, your agent jar file, it will still print hello world from this attachment thread that we've mentioned before. And this is what tooling today uses a lot. And for example, monitoring tooling, performance monitoring tooling, I, I helped to develop one in Stana, for example. They just scan all of your Java processes, and then they hook into them. And that's becoming a more and more common pattern that you just run your uh, code as normal, but then on your application server, you have this agent utility running that discovers all of your pits, of your Java pits, and uh, injects some additional um, monitoring into it, right? Some, some extra code that you didn't add, but that gets added by an external entity, right? And the important concept to understand here that these two JVMs processes are separate. So you, from PID A, you inject code into PID B. The only requirement that the JVM has to you is that if you're running on POSIX, that it's the same user running both processes, because otherwise Java would inherently be insecure, right? You could just scan for PIDs of other users and change their code. That wouldn't be good. So you have to actually be the same user. Even if you're the root user, you still have to change your user identity before you attach to the, the user you want to attach to, uh, just as a security measure, right? And so far, so good. This is a nice thing to do. You can run code in the same Java process, so you can save some resources in the worst case. But um, of course, um, there's more to it. So. The pre-main and the agent method, as we have seen, they have one obligatory argument, which is the argument that you provide either on the command line or using the virtual machine API. But as a second argument, you can specify the instrumentation interface, as you see up here, right? So the, the instrumentation inst argument. And what will happen if you do that is that the JVM will inject an instance uh, into it that is giving you access to a very powerful API that allows you to control um, behavior of the JVM. And the most significant and the most widely used uh, API of that is installing a class file transformer. And a class file transformer is basically a lambda expression. Um, or, I mean, typically it's, it's implemented in a more complex manner, but you can implement it as a lambda expression that takes five arguments and returns a byte array. So what you will get is if you install a so-called class file transformer using the instrumentation API, inst.addTransformer, Every time a class is loaded, and any class, any class that is loaded in this JVM will trigger this transformer, provide the class loader that is loading a class, for example, the class path, the system class loader. It will provide the name of the class, so it might be a Cassandra driver or an HTTP client. Uh, it will provide a constant to the loaded class. It will provide it, uh, the protection domain of the class being loaded, and it will provide, most significantly, the class file, so a byte array of the actual class file that you have compiled or someone has compiled, and it will give you a chance to return another byte array. 
And what the JVM will do then, it will switch out this byte array that uh, you actually loaded with the byte array you provide. And as you can think, uh, this allows you to change behavior. But normally, you don't want to change behavior. You just want to enrich behavior. So what you can do is you can, for example, add a, a matrix counter. Every time method A is executed, you increase the counter, and then you export this information to um, Prometheus, right? And then you can have this legacy app where you lost the source code and you cannot change anything and it's legally not allowed to change it, right? You have all these constraints, but you can still change the behavior by simply writing a Java program that discovers this class name that you know exists and changes the bytecode of the method you want to change. If you don't want to change a method, and that's important, you have to return null because, of course, this isn't free. The JVM has to do some bookkeeping of all the changes you have applied. Um, so, so you basically tell the JVM to not instrument a class in this case. And the same works for HMA methods, of course, but it's not the only functionality uh, there. So you, you can go even further. An agent, method, agent main method might be executed at any time in a JVM's lifecycle, right? It can be attached hours and days and weeks after the JVM has started up, and you might still want to instrument classes that are already loaded in the JVM, and that is perfectly doable. So the add transformer method in the instrumentation interface takes a second argument, a Boolean, that tells you if you want to be able to transform classes that were already loaded. So that's the first thing. And then when you register your class file transformer, after that, you tell the JVM via the instrumentation interface to retransform certain classes. So if, if, for example, if you know Apache HTTP client was already loaded, but I want to count all the HTTP class, uh, calls that are made by the app, then I tell it, find this class that is already loaded, the HTTP client class, and retransform it. Then it will walk through this very same tra transformer that I just transformed, and it can still change its behavior. So even if you have a JVM running for weeks and weeks in production, right, and then suddenly, you know, after a month of, of running, it suddenly has this problem that I can't debug, then you can still go in there in the running process, add the additional logging, the additional metrics you want to extract, and get this information out there. And that actually is very helpful sometimes. If you have customers with weird problems, then, then they tell you, yeah, right, we have to run this app for a year, and then after a year it, it goes sour, and that's not easy to find out, but you can still let the process survive and then basically extract information uh, even if it has been running forever, right? So that's, it's very powerful and you can do a lot with it. But as you expected, you just get very basic input here, a byte array. It doesn't feel approachable for most people, right? Bytecode sounds and class files sounds like this, this scary, uh, difficult, complex, and it can be. So, yeah. Um, but, but the idea, and that's why I'm working with this library, uh, what I will want to show you is that you don't have to know a lot about JVM internals, you don't have to know a lot about class files. Uh, that's very straightforward concepts, they're just very comprehensive. And, and there's libraries like mine that can save you from that by doing all the boring bookkeeping and to let you focus on what you want to do. So, while we can retransform classes, uh, there are limitations to it. And uh, this should be mentioned because otherwise you get the wrong idea of what's possible. And of course, uh, retransformation comes at a cost. The JVM is, is mostly chitted. I mean, there's AOT versions of, of JVMs as well, more and more. But uh, typically, a JVM program is optimized while it's running. If you change the code of uh, the application you're running, the, the JIT compiler has to throw out a lot of things, right? and redo it. So it's, there's a performance overhead of attaching. Also, there are limitations. You cannot change the class hierarchy because this would even break more assumptions, and it's hard to implement a JVM, of course, that has so many features. So you want to limit the scope of what you can do. You can, for example, not add virtual methods that are already virtually dispatched because then you have to scan a much bigger graph of, of, of optimized code throughout. Uh, if you disallow certain things, like adding virtual methods, then you can limit the, this, this bad performance impact, which is, of course, desirable for people that write agents. Because if you attach, like, if you're a performance monitoring tool and you attach to a running process and you will stall this process for a minute, then if that's a web server of a shop, then this shop cannot use your monitoring tool, right? Because it will break uh, the, the production application. So, as mentioned, you can change the behavior, but you cannot add new methods. Even private methods you cannot eat, add. In Java 8, you could add static methods but this was 
uh, and there's even a, a possible extension that, that resolves this, um, this assumption of not adding additional methods when you retransform classes in the JAP 159. Um, and there's a, even a JVM implementation, um, the dynamic code evolution VM that doesn't have this constraint. But this doesn't seem to be a priority here today. And I kind of understand also why it's not that important to get the, the code working, to get these tools working that use this API. So even this possibility of adding static methods has been removed again in Java 9 and onwards. So, so I don't think this will be something you can rely on. But what you can do is you can change the implementation of all methods and of all constructors in your program. You just cannot change the, 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 the shape of, of a class, right? The, the, what you would receive from reflection. What you can do actually is to add annotations. Uh, if that's useful, and sometimes it is, if you, for example, have an agent and you have Hibernate annotations on your class, but you are not using Hibernate, so you want to translate your Hibernate annotations to JPA annotations, then you can write an agent that takes at runtime all the Hibernate annotations and replaces it with the JPA um, co correspondence. And it sounds surrealistic, but this is stuff I actually do sometimes. So uh, there, there's a lot of legacy code, right? And, and if you work as a consultant, you encounter a lot of legacy code. So this is not just abstract skill. This is a very yeah, good thing to can be able to do sometimes, right? Uh, so I'm just trying to show that this is actually uh, something you can use and sometimes is the, the easiest solution. Right, I should mention that there's a, another way of writing Java agents, and that's what you might have heard of before, JVMTI, the Java Virtual Machine Tool Interface. And Java agents basically sit on top of JVMTI. The Java agent, the instrumentation API, is nothing but a delegation to um, the JVMTI API that can do all that Java agents can do and more, um, but you have to write it in C. And if you have written C, I mean, this is just the hello world example of JVMTI. <laughs> Um, here you basically say, I, I set a flag that I can uh, retransform classes because uh, in C++ you don't have, uh, in C you don't have um, Booleans, right? So that's an integer that says turn this feature on and then you add a, a hook down here and then you basically add a callback to some C code that will be triggered. Um, uh, but generally I don't recommend going down this road because first of all, there's not a lot of libraries that allow you for code uh, changes, right, that allow for, for manipulating bytecode in a convenient manner. If you write JVMTI, you're basically on your own. Uh, so what most people actually do, they write JVMTI agent, agents and then they do the retransformation still in Java. So all they do is they call down to ASM or some, some bytecode parser that's written in Java. And of course, you lose the compatibility, right? To, you have to compile for all platforms and you have, to, you have much more chances of getting it wrong. But some people use that and if you have very advanced tooling, and then you're probably not learning about Java agents in this talk for the first time, then this is an option, but I want to mention it because sometimes it does, it's an option to do, right? So, but how can you manipulate code at runtime? What's the basic idea? And this is the last conceptual slide. Afterwards, we dig into what my library does and how you can manipulate code. But conceptually, bytecode manipulation is very easy because you write source code in Java, right? And all you do when you compile it is you turn it into a class file. And a class file is basically, first of all, a list of all constants in, in this class file. Then it's a list of all fields in this class file. And it's a list of all methods in this class file. So if you want to change the behavior of um, the bar method in the class foo, then you will just jump to the, the, the index of methods in the class file. You will find the offset. And then you will change the bytecode. And bytecode in a class file is nothing but a binary, right? If you add a foo.class file in a, in a hex editor, uh, you will just have all these bytes. You have the infamous cafe babe in the beginning to indicate the magic number. It's a Java class file. And then you will have all the constant pool information. And you, if you just read the Java virtual machine specification, it will tell you byte offset that and that points to the method table. And then you jump to the method table. And then it will say, now you jump 15 more bytes to be at the method that is named foo. And then you jump there. And then it says, all right, the code begins at offset this and that. You jump there and then you find the bytecode instructions that represent returning this value. And if you want to change it, you just find these bytecodes and you replace them with what you want to do instead, right? That's all that is there to it. So you bytecode manipulation or class file transformation is just taking a byte array, changing the right bytes to represent what you actually wanted to do. And ByteBuddy does nothing but help you with that. 
So, some practical applications. How can this be useful? Um, if you ever used, used Mukido and Kotlin, then you know that Kotlin had the problem in the beginning that you couldn't mock classes because Kotlin does make, mark every method and every class as final by default, as opposite to Java. And as you know, in Java, and if you use Mukido, you cannot mock final classes. That doesn't work because what we did all the time in Java was that we created a subclass where we overwrote all the methods, and that's a mock, right? We overwrote all the methods that were virtual to do nothing, or, or the behavior specified in the API, but basically nothing for the most. And uh, there you have your mock. Because now, by overriding the methods, they don't do anything. It's an empty implementation there, right? With Kotlin, it doesn't work anymore. So what did we do when Kotlin came out uh, in Mokido? Or what did I do <laughs> when Kotlin came out, uh, since I'm the, the bytecode guy on Mokido, um, obviously? Um, basically, what we do first is that we attach to ourselves. We know that there's dynamic attached, there's the tool API, so we find our own PID and then attach to ourselves and trigger a Java agent in the current Java virtual machine. Now we have access to the instrumentation interface, and now you tell us, I want to mock class A, right? What we do then is we take class foo, not class A, class foo, and we want the mock uh, bar, right? So we rewrite the, the method bar to do nothing, conditionally. So basically what it just does is we have a map uh, or a set of all mocks, right? And in the beginning of the method, we just check if this instance is a mock, do nothing. If this instance is not a mock, do what you normally do. And ta-da, we have mocked classes for Kotlin where everything is final. This is a real-time use case for Java agents run millions of times every day. This is how we do it, right? It's that easy. Uh, another uh, thing I worked with for a long time when I was a consultant for Instana, which is an APM tooling company, and I, I use it as an example so I know it best, right? And it's what I mentioned before. You have a Java process, you have a monitoring tool deployed in production, so you scan for all pits, right? And then you put your agent into it. But how do these tools work normally? If you just put your full load of instrumentation into every JVM found, this would be very heavy. So you just deploy a very small agent, you analyze the code, you change a bit of the code, you give feedback to the host monitor, you find out what you actually should do, and given this, this set of classes you find there, and then you deploy a new one and you just update again, right? So you can incrementally adjust um, the functionality. And more and more tooling is using that. Um, I, I, I know it because I get the bug reports into <laughs> uh, ByteBuddy's repo. So every time, it's a, it's a fairly, I'd say the JVMTI doesn't seem to be the most loved API by Oracle Engineering. So um, if, you, if you want to find out about what's buggy in new JVM versions, you just run JVMTI. And you typically encounter a few bugs there. But um, it is surprisingly stable. And also, this is run by thousands and thousands of JVMs daily and works very well. And this is how all the monitoring tooling works. That's actually even how some of the tooling that's bundled with the JV JDK works working. They just attach to a foreign process. JVisual VM, how they're doing it, right? They go in there and they do basically some analysis based on this, right? Yeah, so, and you can too. Right, as mentioned, and the use case doesn't need to be that comprehensive. There's very good small use cases for agents as well. And I mean, it even works with Docker. If you just scan for Docker containers, and you just transfer a file in the container, and then you open port and report out, so you can do very, very good analysis using, using agent tooling. Yes, so much for, what, how much time do I have left, by the way? I don't have a clock. My watch crashed before I started talking. 25 minutes, all right, perfect. So, uh, half time, so um, what I want to do in the rest, now that I explain to you what agents are and what they can be used for, I want to show you how to write your own agents. And this is basically my, my feature pitch, my open source, free open source library called ByteBuddy. And I want to also show you why it, it has become so popular, I think, um, and why code instrumentation used to be very difficult and is not more anymore. So, the, the gold standard of code instrumentation, and you have probably heard of ASM, uh, is, is this library called ASM. It's been around forever, almost as long as Java, and even OpenJDK itself uses ASM to implement Lambda expressions. So, if you look into the Lambda Meta Factory class, which is where all Lambda, factories, uh, Lambda expressions are born, so Lambda expressions basically are nothing more than a runtime generated class that implements a single uh, functional interface, right? And then it does so dynamically by creating this. And this is just a solution until they might find something better, but today this is how it is. 
And ASM uses a visitation API. So basically, for every class file that you get, you create a, a class reader instance. And then you can um, also create a writer. And then the reader can accept a writer. And then basically pushes every instruction it finds in the, or every constant pool, every method entry, every field entry it finds in a class file, it will basically notify the writer, and the writer will just write it back into a class file. But between the reader and the writer, you can place any amount of so-called class visitors that do transformations for every instruction you encounter. So instead of putting the, the writer directly in the reader, you basically put a class visitor in the reader, and then the class visitor takes the writer as an argument. So it will first delegate to this visitor that you just put in there, and then if you call the super.visit method, it will push the like, modified instruction down to the writer. So what we have done here, we put this visitor in, and then we implemented the visit method, which is basically called once for every class, and that uh, basically tells you what class file version this class has, what modifiers this class has, what the name of the class is, the generic signature of the class, the name of the superclass and the, the names of all interfaces being implemented. And what we do here is that we enrich the access modifier with a, a public modifier. So what this transformation does, it takes a class file of a potentially packaged private class and it makes them public. As easy as that. This is how ASM works and for these simple use cases it works great. But since it's an instruction-based API, it can get very messy very quickly. Let's just look into it very shortly. This is how you add a bit of code to a method. Now we override the visit method method that is invoked every time you encounter a method entry in a class file. And then we have to wrap the method visitor, which is then basically chained to visit every single instruction, to walk through it. And then you basically can tell it here. All right, once the method begins at the visit code callback, I invoke the, um, I want to get the field system out. I want to push the value hello world on the stack, and then I want to invoke the print steam printl method on out and hello world. And so what bytecode is, and I'm not going to go into bytecode deeply here. I have given talks on bytecode. If you're interested in this, this goes very thoroughly through all the instructions and then all the, the fundamentals of it. But for what the JVM basically is, or the, the class file format is, is a, or the bytecode format is, is a stack language where you push values onto a, an operand stack and then you pop them off by instructions that consume the values in the order they're on the, on the stack. So if you want to print hello world, you, print the, you push the object to print two on the stack, then you print the value to print on the stack, and then you invoke the method that consumes these two to execute the printl, right? And this is, of course, ugly. If you go into your team and you have a junior developer right from university on your team and you have this code all over your base, then these people won't get productive anytime because this can get messy and it's also a rather dangerous operation because if you get it wrong and it's easy to get it wrong, your JVM will just fail, right? There's no compiler protecting you. There's uh, nothing that, no type system that will break here. If you shuffle around the instructions and you push values in the wrong order, um, so, so it's very, very volatile to change this. It's very um, yeah, dangerous to do it, or not dangerous because the JVM has a so-called verifier that, that makes sure that nothing uh, is broken. Fortunately enough, the verifier, it's the, to currently you can still disable the verifier and some people do it because they have old tooling that, that require it for some reason. Um, but in the future it will go away, so you won't be able to run unsafe code in the JVM anymore. But of course, if you're a tooling vendor and you write this monitoring tool and it attaches dynamically to all JVMs running on a server and you have a verifier error in there and it shuts down all VMs by breaking the code, then your customers won't be happy. So, so if you write tooling, then, then this, is, this is difficult to maintain and expensive to maintain. I think uh, what I offer is a better alternative. So what ByteBuddy tries to do is to wrap all or hide all the ASM uh, part and offer DSL to make it more approachable to write code like that, right? And um, underneath, it still uses ASM to emit these instructions for you, but it tries to wrap it in a type-safe manner. So with ByteBuddy, what you basically just do is you, you create an instance of agent builder. You say, all right, I want to instrument all types that have a super type named like this. What ByteBuddy will do then is it will scan all class files check if they implement this interface or the superclass, and then take all these superclass interfaces it fi finds in a class file, finds the class files to those class files, and go down the hierarchy to see if it discovers it somewhere. Once discovered, it triggers a transformer where you basically just say, give me any method in the class file, and then I want to intercept 
um, the method call. Uh, I want to intercept this, this um, the all methods, and I want to add a method call to print stream string class on the field out of the system class, and I want to add hello world as an argument and I invoke it. And then I want to invoke the super method, the original code that I intended to, or that was there before. Well, ByteBody will do them, and then you install it, right? ByteBody will do them, it will take the method through, it will copy the original method into a new method, and then basically um, invoke these, this original method um, afterwards as a super call and print out hello world before. For the two-string method, that's impossible because it's already declared in the super type, so we'll just invoke the super method instead, but it will dynamically for you resolve um, this hierarchical change, so you don't have to worry about it. But actually, this API, while it's very powerful, the method call API and the delegation API and everything, again, I have talks on that if you're interested, and it's not what I want to talk about. I want to show you how to write dynamic agents that do not change the, the class file format, as I told you before, which isn't possible for retransformation. I want to show you what is called advice and which allows you to inject code without changing the hierarchy um, by just um, adding code at the beginning and the end of the method. And that's an important limitation to understand. With advice, you can add code at the beginning and the end of the method. With everything else, you can do whatever. You can call a super method multiple times. You can uh, omit it altogether. With advice, uh, it's, it's not that powerful, but it has the nice property that it doesn't change the class layout, so you can retransform classes in any way you want. So, what is advice? Basically, uh, advice is um, a Java method or a Java class with a method annotated with on method enter or a method exit. And these methods will be discovered by ByteBuddy and will not be executed, but they will be used as a template to inline code into another class. So if you say, I want to instrument all types of the super type, my target user type, uh, then I can take them and find them, right? And then I copy the code in the advice method, and that's important, I copy it over to the original method. And that's basically what you need to understand. You write code, but you write it as a template in Java, and then ByteBody can take the bytecode omitted by the Java compiler, adjust it accordingly to match the target class where you want to inline this code, and just translate it there. And since Java C hopefully never omit, emits illegal bytecode, always emits legal bytecode, the transfer step is very small compared to writing everything in ASM. And uh, you can write whatever complex uh, method you want to, and ByteBuddy reliably translates it over. And basically, this, take my word for it, you copy this, this HMA method you see there, you can copy it, package it in a class file, and print out hello world wherever you want. <laughs> I let it up to you to write something actually useful, but it's all you need to understand. You don't have to think about bytecode, and this is the idea of ByteBuddy. It sh should take care of all the boring work, of all the bookkeeping, and so forth and you just uh, write the, the business logic you want to implement, and then it inlines the code for you. But it inlines it, so if you put, like, if you run it in debugging mode and you put a breakpoint into the onEnter method, this breakpoint will never be triggered. So don't forget it, it's a, it's a template. It's not a method being executed. And now you can just tell ByteBuddy to disable class format changes, which is a hint to do some optimizations that you will never need to change the method hierarchy, so ByteBuddy can save itself some overhead, and then you enable retransform, and now you have, a Java, you have now written a Java agent that adds hello world to this class no matter when you attach the agent, right? So you're all good, basically. And how does this work? Yeah, but as I said, it just copies it. It's a bit more complex if you add, add exit advice. What ByteBuddy will do then, it will just enter the, the entry advice, but the exit advice, um, it will basically copy the return value once it's reached into a local variable, then trigger the exit advice and then return the value. You can do this in ASM, but uh, just one more example before we go further, um, how complex this can be in practice. If you have multiple return values, what ByteBuddy needs to do is to basically assign a local variable before, always assign um, the return value when you find one to this local variable, and then issue a go-to statement to the end of the method where it finds the, the exit advice, and um, then return the value after that, right? In ASM, as I said, it's fully possible to do this, and ByteBuddy does it using ASM, but you don't have to worry about all this logic. You just implement this code, and now you have this nice property that if you're a performing tooling vendor with 200 employees, you can still hire people from university, junior developers that can focus on implementing the, the, the business logic you're interested in without worrying about having verifier errors in production in the end. Right, so please try it out. Uh, 
can find it on GitHub and on Maven Central, obviously. And uh, yeah, exactly. You can, of course, ac uh, access arguments as well. You have injection API for that. All arguments on and advice methods are merely virtual. Again, it's a template. It's not an actual thing. You can tell it, right, every time I access the argument rel in the actual method, I also want to access the, the argument in index zero, right? Now, by chance, these two arguments have the same index, but this is necessary. You can put whatever annotation you want there, and it will represent the value. And ByteBuddy will, when it discovers in the template that you access one annotated parameter, it will dynamically rewrite it to the actual bytecode instruction that represents what you told ByteBuddy you want to do by the annotation. And there's a bunch of, of these um, annotations. Um, and again, there's a talk with the exact same name, and they always have the same name. <laughs> because I'm not creative enough to phrase them correctly, but if you find on YouTube the one I gave in, in, at JPoint in Russia last August, I go through all these in detail. Because in Russia they always want hardcore talks. And I gave them one, <laughs> I said it was too, too much, but uh, I go through all the gory details of how these translations happen. And if you're deep into it, at some point I think it's really interesting to understand it, because you of course should always understand the stack you're using anyways. All right, so for example, if you annotate an, 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 a parameter to your advice method, like this one here, with advice.field value instead of, of argument, like the third one here, then it will take a string as its argument, and then you will access this field whenever you read the variable of the parameter, right? You don't, as I said, this is just a template. It doesn't, doesn't exist as code. It's just a representation of the value you want to access, and ByteBuddy will then replace this argument bytecode, argument loading bytecode, with the field loading bytecode, right? And, and do it accordingly, and so forth. You can even, in ex exit advice, you can capture the return value and uh, the, the a potential exception that was thrown. You can also trigger exit advice in a try catch block. Um, and then, for example, you can check the, the exception and suppress it. Again, this is something I actually did. Big legacy application threw exceptions randomly in some adapter that wasn't even used. We couldn't change the code base because it was a third party product we didn't own, didn't have the, the legal authority to change the source. So we just found the stack, we just checked the names in the stack. We thought, okay, this tries to connect to some old uh, license server that doesn't exist anymore because the company is not operational anymore. We don't care about this, but it breaks our code, so we just instrument this method, catch the exception, suppress it. We're good. It's still running in production. Right. And all kinds of things. You can actually retry methods, so you can jump back to the beginning of the method from exit advice to say, like, let's try this once more. You can jump over the actual method from enter advice, say like, I don't even want to execute the real code, go to the exit advice right away. There's so all kinds of things you can do, and ByteBuddy does it transparently. How much time I have left now? Ten minutes, Ten minutes all right. So, thank you, watch, for crashing. <laughs> it's a problem with digital watches, right? Right. So, um, yeah, limitations of a device template, I've said it a bunch of times now. You cannot have fields in there because they're just templates. These fields don't really exist or they're not visible necessarily. And you cannot add helper methods because if you invoke like a private method from your advice template, then this code, this static, private static call would be inlined into your target. But since the target is another class than your advice template, the private method is invisible and you again will get a verify error or in case of using ByteBuddy, fortunately it's discovered and you'll get a runtime exception that just aborts the transformation, but if you design your advice and you have this, this neat little utility method that does a lot of work, then unfortunately you have to unfold this code into your actual advice. So the advice needs to be self-contained and it cannot reference uh, small helper methods, which of course requires some discipline and coding. Um, but, but all in all, uh, you shouldn't add too much code anyways. Uh, JVM, the JIT compiler especially, is very heuristical. If you, if you create a lot of code in important methods, like a HTTP client, then you will certainly disturb the JIT compiler to make it less efficient to be compiled, and uh, you will cause performance problems potentially for your customers, right? So shorter methods typically are better, because the, the bigger the bytecode count is, the less uh, likely it is to be inlined and the less likely it is to be on, on a good um, yeah, compiled state. Right. So instead, and you can do that, you can implement your own bindings of parameter values. Instead of having like, your, your value that you want to put in there, you can just have a custom binding, and then instead, ByteBuddy will add bytecode instruction to load the value you want to represent there. But everything you read from in a method needs to be in the arguments of the method. 
uh, and not a static field or something, right? All right, yeah, and yeah. Uh, just to mention this as well, uh, you can do in-method code substitution as well in ByteBuddy. So if you, for example, and, and again, this is something I really discovered, you have a library you use and they have printl statements there, here and there, and they disturb your logging and they, they do all kinds of weird things. Then ByteBuddy in advice, uh, or outside of advice, allows you to do member substitution. You say in the method um, <coughs> foo, I want to remove all methods printl, just stop them out. And what ByteBuddy will do, it will go through your code, find all these invocations, and remove them. Alternatively, you can replace them with another method, for example, with the actual logging API that you want to invoke. So you can tell it, instead of calling system out printl, replace all these printl statements with uh, a statement to invoke a specific logger I want to trigger, right? So all, all this also works. All right, now it's probably five more minutes. <laughs> so, hmm, pardon? Ten. It's still 10, all right. <laughs> Awesome. So infinitive time. Then we can go deep now. All right, because I want to I wanna talk about class loading a little bit at least uh, because it is important to understand. I think not only when you work with agents, I think class loading is one of the most complex uh, uh, topics in the JVM that, that people struggle with. And when you develop agents, it's extra painful. And uh, the reason for that is, is this here. You normally expect this hierarchy. You know, like uh, if you run Java, it, there's a boot class loader that is represented by the value null, mainly to protect the JVM to, towards reflective action. You can't reflect a null, but you can reflect an instance, right? Uh, and the, the boot loader loads all the fundamental classes, like Java lang object, like Java lang string, but also HTTP URL connection, all these things that are in the class library. Then until Java 8, you had the extension class loader, which was a rather arcane concept to allow adding classes to a JVM that aren't specified in the class class. And this was typically you want to add some, I don't know, TLS uh, library that does some encryption for you and, and you know how it is with export restrictions. You couldn't ship the JVM having this bundled, so you had to ship them in separate artifacts, but then you could easily patch the JVM to include it. And then you put it in the, in the extension folder of the JDK installation you were running, and magically these classes would appear in your runtime. But mostly you interact with the system class loader, which represents the class path. Uh, everything you put on the minus CP uh, is, will be there. And the world could be so, so simple, but um, of course uh, people found out that you can do a lot of interesting things with class loaders. For example, you can implement application servers. So Tomcat, for example, for every application you deploy, will create a separate class loader. And normally, a class loader tries to load a class from its parent first. So if you load Java Lang object, the boot class loader will be asked first, and then it will try to load it from the system class loader after. But web servers, it's the other way around. So suddenly, your, your own class loader will be asked first, and then you go up to avoid collisions on the class path. So the, the, the beauty of it, if, in Tom, if you do it right in Tomcat, you will have three apps deployed. And if you want to remove one, you just tell Tomcat to, to basically make this class loader garbage collectible, and it will disappear, and the other two apps can run the same JVM process. You also have OSGI. OSGI has the same idea in basic. It, it has modules and only allows you to see other class loaders that you imported. So if you try to load a class from OSGI class loader, you will ask the OSGI parent for it, and the parent will see what packages you import and what packages other class loaders export, and then will delegate back up the hierarchy and uh, allow you to load classes from, from parents, that, uh, from class loaders you're not even in hierarchical relation with. And if you write an agent and you want to instrument a class, the class you want to instrument can be on either of these class loaders. Your Java agent, however, will always, yeah, and you can, of course, have any class loader, your Java agent, of course, will be loaded on the system class loader. So it's if you want to instrument a class that's loaded by Tomcat, it doesn't necessarily mean that your agent is visible to the Tomcat application. So if you want to, or that your agent can see the classes there. So you will be able to discover them, or ByteBuddy will be able to discover them, but they cannot communicate. You cannot load classes from there, for example. And what you should do for that, because if your advice, for example, references the HTTP request servlet class or your custom tracing class that's somewhere, it's not necessary that these classes are loaded. So if you run advice, as I showed you before here, 
then you will get a no class dev found error. Because despite the fact that you discovered a servlet class, since the servlet class isn't on the system class loader, but somewhere down in the Tomcat hierarchy, it cannot be found, and this will not be possible. To overcome this, ByteBody has its own API again, where you do not reference advice by its loaded name, but by a string representing it. What ByteBody will do then, it will discover all the class loaders involved in an instrumentation, create a proxy to resolve classes from multiple class loaders by the name, and then it basically projects the reflection API onto an API that is exactly identical to the reflection API, and all your instrumentation will go against that, making it work. It's fairly complicated, but all you need to do is this, and you should remember doing that, because that way ByteBuddy takes care of all the class loader mess uh, for you. And I, I can and, and did also again give this talk with a strong focus um, on class loading. You can watch that one if you watch the JavaScript one. N now has time progressed, <laughs> five minutes, perfect. So we are still moving forward. Um, but instead of talking even more about class loaders, I'll jump over all this See? and uh, show you how to make agents updatable which also is related to class loaders. So, a class loader can be garbage collected only if all of its classes can be garbage collected. So, uh, the, point, the thing is, a, a Java class references a, a cl its class loader, and a class loader references all of its classes. The system class loader is anchored in the JVM. The system class loader can never be garbage collected. So, if you load a Java agent, which will always be loaded on the system class loader, this Java agent is forever. It will never be unloaded. So how can you work uh, around this and make agents updatable if you cannot unload classes? Because if you do enough incremental updates to an agent, you will trash the class loader, you will fill up the code cache and, and the meta space for, forever, and you will eventually run out of, of, of memory, hopefully. If you have not set constraints, the machine will run out of memory. That's even worse. Um, but it's, it's very simple, and again, uh, I coined the term trampoline agent, where you do not do anything in the agent. The agent is ju just that. You uh, provide a URL location as an argument instead of providing the actual agent, and then in the agent that is the trampoline, you just create a new class loader, reference this actual agent as an argument to the, the new class loader you're creating, and then you load the actual entry point from there, and then you remove the reference to this class loader you potentially already have in, attached. So think about running this for a second time. The first time you've created a class loader, you've loaded your agent, right? And you have invoked it with the instrumentation instance you got and the, the reference to the previous class loader, which will be null the first time. The second time, uh, you will load the new agent because the URL has changed uh, to version 2. You will again trigger the entry point, and now you will offer a link to the agent you have installed before. So hopefully you can tell this old agent to shut down, and then you spin up. And this is then how you can do it, right? You have loaded your agent version 1, then you attach your agent version 2, which then resolves agent version 1 uh, as a reference that makes the class loader of agent version 1 collectible and all of its classes, so it's unloaded and disappears. And this way you can keep on updating an existing JVM process that runs for years and years without a loss of memory, right? or waste of energy you lose, of course, by the agent classes that we actually use, but other than that, it works fine. Um, miscellaneous, yeah, you can self-attach, as I mentioned, from the Mokito use case. It's unfortunately not so easy because uh, Oracle built in a, a, a blockage where you have to explicitly allow that because it's, it self-scans for the PID that uh, is attaching. It doesn't allow to at attach from the same PID to itself as a security mechanism. So how do we do it in Mokito? Uh, so we just start a new JVM and attach from there. And that works again, because now you have a new PID, right? And you can start a new VM. One minute, right. Um, but unfortunately, you have to do this. Uh, fortunately for you, in ByteBuddy, I in implemented this as a single method call. It does everything for you and finds the most efficient way. Uh, you can also attach agents to different VMs if you have the PID, and you don't have to worry about it. The project's called ByteBuddy Agent, and it's the same space as ByteBuddy. Right, and I even implemented all the attach APIs myself, such that you have to, don't have to worry about um, anything. So even if, the, if you're not running a JDK, you can just run it um, from 
I basically just re-implemented the API. I just looked at the code, open source, hooray, uh, and, and redid it. And now you can do it even without. And then you don't have the silly restriction either because I just omitted it. Um, and all this we won't do because one minute is not a lot of time. Um, so I'll just go to the end of it. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I'll be around for all day. Yeah. Just find me if you have questions. And thank you so much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the conference. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you.